chers, chers membres de notre communauté universitaire. Je suis extrêmement heureux et ravi, et nous sommes extrêmement heureux et ravis d'accueillir la professeure Ricciucci, qui a nous fait l'amitié de donner une conférence, alors qu'elle vient des États-Unis, elle est régulière en, en Europe. Elle a reçu ce matin, comme vous le savez, le docteur Honoris Causa, et c'est vraiment un très grand plaisir de l'accueillir ici. I will switch now to English. I think it's more convenient uh, for you. Uh, dear Professor Ricciucci, uh, we are extremely pleased and honored uh, to welcome you here. Uh, it will be a great pleasure uh, to hear you. Uh, I think uh, it's a very timely issue that uh, you will uh, discuss. You have a very impressive uh, CV. I've seen that you have received uh, many uh, prestigious awards, also recently. And Very recently, actually, uh, this morning, uh, you have been bestowed uh, the title of Dr. Honoris Causa by the University of Lausanne. Uh, that was a, pro a, pro a proposition, a proposal of our faculty. So we are extremely uh, proud uh, to have you uh, here. You are especially interested in public management, but I would say, and as I said this morning, uh, you have a, a very broad view on public management. Uh, it includes uh, issue relating to uh, diversity, uh, critical race uh, theory. Uh, you will discuss that uh, today. It will be uh, great because it's a, you know, it's a very timely issue. And I must say that in Europe, we know about it, but at the same time, uh, there is probably some meaning misunderstanding in this respect. And it's very important uh, uh, to have uh, uh, someone like you uh, who really knows uh, the matter, who really knows uh, what's at stake, uh, Uh, to discuss uh, this uh, topic. Uh, so many thanks uh, again uh, to take the time uh, to have this, uh, this small lecture that will be interactive, I'm sure, uh, that will uh, also uh, uh, create some reactions uh, from the public. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Ricciucci. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. It's an honor to be here and I, an honor to be the recipient of the honorable doctorate. And um, I thank uh, David and, is it Niles or Niels? Niels. Niels, that's what I thought. I, <laughs> or um, Niels, if you prefer. Would you, pardon? Niels. 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 French. French, okay. Niels, that's what I was looking up and I saw three different pronunciations. So I said <laughs> Niels, but um, thank you for your hospitality and showing me around and um, for um, hosting my visit here. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, So what I'm trying to do here is, uh, you know, push the envelope a little bit with public administration, um, move us in a further direction. We, we have a number of theories in public administration. Certainly one is representative bureaucracy, which I study a great deal. Um, this is um, a theory that's used in other disciplines, particularly the social sciences. Um, criminal justice and sociology, social psychology. Um, and I mean, even if it's just epistemic reflexivity, it's thinking about other theories to apply to public administration. And I think it is particularly timely um, globally. Um, and I think not only in Europe, but in the US, there's a great misunderstanding because it's been politicized by the right Uh, in the U.S., and so it's, it's, it's seen as a cudgel, a, something very negative by what I call the, the MAGA, MAGA right, the Make America Great Again right, um, which is what Trump brought in. And, um, and so it, it's become very politicized, but again, I'm trying to take it back to how do we look at it in public administration and how can we apply it, because it is being applied in other social sciences uh, as well. So. So that's what I am going to talk about today. Um, so what is critical race theory? Well, it's a framework that really adopts a race-conscious approach to looking at uh, institutional and structural racism. I mean, that's, that's basically what it's looking at. I mean, very simple, very simple terms. Um, uh, and th the aim is to promote uh, social justice. And so the notion is, is you know, if we, if we could dismantle inst institutional racism and structural racism, we might not need things like representative bureaucracy. Representative bureaucracy is needed because we don't have adequate representation in the U.S., and you may not in Europe as well. But in the U.S., our 
political institutions, the elected positions, are primarily white and primarily men. So we then say we need representative bureaucracy in the sense that because we can't rely on our elected representatives, bureaucracy is intended and needed to represent the constituency. Blacks for blacks, Latinx or Latinx for uh, Latinx in the community. If we broke down and dismantled institutional and structural racism, we wouldn't need representative bureaucracy because it would be organic. We would have that representation. Um, so the major premises, legal, political, and economic institutions are inherently racist. We don't really see it explicitly, but it is there. Um, race is something that is socially constructed and it enables and justifies the ability of whites to promote their own economic, social, and political interests at the expense of black and brown people. <clears throat> And certainly it's important for critical uh, for public administration because we do place a lot of attention on social equity. It's been called the third pillar of our field by George Fredrickson and Susan Gooden. I call it the first pillar. I think social equity and pursuing social equity is a, is a, is a major goal for public administration. Um, to achieve social equity and justice, uh, uh, racism needs to be addressed and confronted directly, and certainly the global Black Lives Matter movement is an example of the urgency and significance of applying these different theories to public administrative phenomenon. And uh, certainly, we can look to the, uh, the killing of George Floyd in May of 2020, where uh, an officer, uh, Chauvin, put his knee on um, George Floyd's neck and basically choked him to death. Um, years earlier, in, in my backyard, I live in New York City, Manhattan. This is a borough of um, New York City, Staten Island. Eric Gardner was placed in a chokehold for selling Lucy's on the street. Lucy's are loose cigarettes. He was selling them uh, out on the street. Um, and he got an internal, I, I shouldn't say he got into an altercation. He dared to. Uh, say to the police officers, I'm, you know, basically out here minding my own business. I'm trying to make a buck. Um, they don't, they didn't like him talking back to the police officers. So they put him in chokehold. They ended up killing him. Um, so it's, it's not a, it's not a new uh, phenomenon in the, in the States. And, uh, you know, this shows the, the um, global effect of the George Floyd killing. Uh, in June 2020, the EU Parliament voted to declare Black Lives Matter and a resolution to denounce racism and white supremacy. The resolution has no legal ramification but sent a signal of support to anti-racism protests. And the resolution was passed by 493 votes to 104, strongly condemning the appalling death of George Floyd. And that was a, a bit of a turning point as well because it was the first time really a police officer was convicted of the crime the, the police officer of Pantaleo that killed um, Eric Garner uh, was not convicted. Um, uh, Chauvin was convicted and he's sentenced to about 25 years in jail, although he's trying to appeal that. But that's rare um, to see a conviction when this sort of thing happens in, um, in the U.S. Um, a little bit of background, it really started with legal scholars in the U.S. and they were trying to address the problem of racism throughout the world. And they say that this, uh, the theoretical centers around the experience and needs of ethnic minorities and people of color, people that are dis disenfranchised, people that are disadvantaged, di dis um, the throwaways, if you will, in society. So it's not just blacks and Latinx, it's Muslim, it's Jewish, it's Roma. Um, however it is defined in a particular community, but it challenges the dominant frameworks and ideologies that are white-centered or white supremacist in origin. And it maintains that racism, race, and its intersections with other identity markers like gender, like ethnicity, like class, are an endemic part of society and they're institutionalized in and by the law and public policies. So you don't really see it, like I said, now it says it's not limited to individual acts, but when you think about institutions, institutions are made up of people and individuals and those things contribute to the institutionalized and structural racism. Um, and
And as I mentioned, critical race theories have, uh, theory has moved to other disciplines um, besides the law. Again, it's more commonly seen in sociology, education, health, criminology. Um, it's becoming much more popular. And again, um, I'm trying to push the field into thinking of um, replying this theory because it's, it's a little more contemporary and I think it's a little bit more global and universal. Um, so some examples here. Um, we see that racism is it's permeated in civil and human rights laws and housing and employment where housing transactions and employment criteria were racist and still are in many cases, uh, even though they may not be racist in intent. And you see this, for example, I don't know if you rely on merit and hiring and, um, and Swiss government for government employees, uh, but merit is, merit does not promote um, meritorious employees. We don't necessarily hire the best employees when we use merit exams, and we use merit exams in the U.S. for all public employee positions for the most part. It's not neutral, and it doesn't promote or represent competence. Um, it, in effect, has a disproportionately harsh impact on people of color. We've known that historically, um, and when we say it has a disproportionate impact, it, it's due to the fact that the exams are culturally biased. It doesn't mean you take an exam and translate it into Spanish or you translate it into an Asian language. It, it means that people don't have an equal opportunity to the tools and skills necessary to sit together and take the exam. So you don't have an equal opportunity to what you, what you need to know to take these exams. That's what we mean by cultural bias. And we still have these exams and we still use them. Uh, we still have racially segregated schools. They've been outlawed since 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education decision, but we still have um, segregated schools throughout the U.S. Major tenets is that race is socially constructed. It doesn't stem from natural differences, although that's what some would like to suggest. It produces negative effects in our society. White supremacy has cre created and maintained institutions and systems that subordinate black and brown persons, particularly through white liberal ideas of law and equal protection. Again, it just further disenfranchises them and further marginalizes them. Um, neutrality and objectivity cannot be fully actualized on issues of race and racism. Societies are not neutral on race issues. They may seem to be or suggest they are, but they're not. Researchers cannot separate themselves from what they observe. And I believe that from an epistemic uh, standpoint as well, that there's no such thing as pure objectivity in research. And some, and some can argue against that. But, um, and the goal, of course, to, is to promote an ethos of human liberation. So critical race methodology originally started out um, with law, critical legal studies, looking at um, law and public policies and, and analyzing them and, and, and discovering that they're not value free or they're not neutral. Well, <clears throat> we've moved to uh, qualitative as well as quantitative research methods uh, to study race issues with this CRT framework. Uh, in terms of qualitative, yeah. excuse me, I've got to get a hair tie because it's very hot and I have very <laughs> thick hair. Um, excuse me. And um, I hope this doesn't uh, disrupt if you're taping this, but um, it promotes a better understanding. This is, this is with qualitative research in general, and I, I do believe that qualitative research is important for public administration. It is eschewed in the U.S. in our field of public administration. There is there is a tendency to promote quantitative research uh, in our field, and you know it's it's easy to count. You can count and you can do myriad studies with numbers and databases. But qualitative research, even if if it's a critical critical race theory study, it gives you more context and you can study the nuances of what's happening uh, in, the, in the situation. Uh, so critical uh, race methodologies include storytelling, biographies, family histories, and narrative inquiry. 
and the research is grounded in the experiences and knowledge of, of black and brown people. Again, I'm using black and brown people because these are the, the persons that tend to be marginalized most in the US and disadvantaged and disenfranchised. Um, let me give you an example of one qualitative study. Um, she relies on narrative of Romero, and she's basically studying race and immigration in Chandler, uh, Arizona, where is a, there is a high Latinx, Latinx population. And I'm, I'm going to read this just to give you the context. Uh, the police department and the Tucson Border Patrol require a supermarket to profile its patrons for citizenship. Officers requested that the store's assistant manager, Ms. Rodriguez, announce over the store's loudspeaker that all illegal aliens who are shopping should turn themselves over to law enforcement officers in the parking lot. Rodriguez refused, so the police and Border Patrol set up a command center in the parking lot near the store and began following and stopping all customers who appeared Mexican, asking for identification or proof of citizenship. So profiling. White customers were not profiled. A man with two small children, about three to four years of age, was stopped by the officers as he walked out of the store. The man talked to the officers as he walked to his truck. He opened the door on the passenger side of the truck and placed his children in the vehicle. He then walked around the truck to the driver's side. At this time, a Border Patrol officer approached the passenger door and placed the wheel of his bicycle behind the door to prevent it from being closed. A Chandler police officer placed his bicycle wheel behind the driver's door in a similar fashion. The Chandler officer talked to the man for a few minutes, then began to pull him from the truck cab. The Border Patrol officer then rounded the cab and helped the Chandler officer. They pulled him from the cab, the, uh, uh, handcuffed him, and placed him in a police van. The children were crying and very upset, and an officer returned to the truck in about five minutes and made a phone call. This, I mean, this is much more in-depth than what I'm giving you. I've given you a few extracts here, but it's an incredible narrative study of, of what goes on um, in, in Arizona, which, like I said, has a very high um, Latinx population. The children were left in the truck alone for a total of 15 to 20 minutes. So the narrative depicts how Latinx elder was demeaned, humiliated, and subordinated in front of his children and other customers in the parking lot solely based on his physical appearance. The young children witnessed their father uh, as he was placed at risk before the law and was treated as inferior compared to white customers. And Romero further points out that although citizens who leave children in cars in the summer can be prosecuted for child endangerment, this man's children were left by the officers in July's triple-digit temperature without parent concern for their safety or fear of legal action against them. So this is just one example of qualitative that work that's been done outside the field of public administration, but again, something that is certainly applicable to public administration. Um, in terms of quantitative research, even those who apply quantitative tools to critical race theory studies in um, other fields in social sciences and health and criminology, um, they, they offer caveats. And these are some of the caveats they, they offer. Avoid using race as a variable that reifies race as a biological construct. It's not a biological it's, it's constructed by society. <clears throat> in, include variables that focus on structure and institutions in order to avoid focusing solely on individual factors, but focusing on individual factors is also important because it's cumulative. Focus on malleable factors where interventions can produce change, which I'll show you an example of. Consider a mixed methods approach. I'm very um, supportive of use of mixed methods in the field of public administration. Acknowledge that we cannot separate analysis from the analyst. And then also acknowledge that the disciplinary context in which we operate are primarily de defined and led by white scholars. So here's one example of a quantitative study. Um, Wittenbrink, uh, Brink and colleagues ran two socio-psychological experiments to demonstrate the malleability of implicit racism or bias towards blacks. 
And the premise is, is that stereotypes and attitudes activated spontaneously from memory can be altered by situational or contextual cues. So they ran a couple of experiments, and they varied the priming procedures in these um, experiments. Experiment one, they showed short little movie clips. And they asked, do white participants' implicit attitudes towards black, blacks vary as a result of exposure to a positive, a family barbecue, or a negative, a gang incident, stereotypic situation? The second experiment involved just pictures, so, um, you know, still pictures. Visual context included a spray painted wall, ostensibly to uh, the researchers to indicate a ghetto and a church. And the results were interesting because what they found was that attitudes vary with the situational context in both experiments, and there were whites, Asians, and blacks in this experiment. That racial attitudes as measured by sequential priming tasks uh, where whites viewed a positive stereotypic image of blacks helped to attenuate the racial biases and racism of whites. Um, Gilbert and Ray uh, applied a quantitative critical race theory framework to police brutality studies. Um, and they used it in the context of justifiable homicides. There are about 28, 29 states uh, in the United States that have justifiable homicide laws. And so that means if you, a police officer shoots a black person, let's say, Michael Brown, for example, was shot. He was a young teenager back in 2014. Um, he was killed by a police officer. He had his hands in the air but he was shot and killed. The police officer s claimed that it was a justifiable homicide because it was self-defense. He thought Michael Brown had a weapon. He, he didn't have a weapon. He didn't have a knife. He didn't even have a phone in his hand. Um, but th the justifiable homicide laws have basically allowed a lot of police officers to escape uh, prosecution and conviction. And I mean, the interesting thing that happens is this, this was Ferguson, Missouri, and this was a, a small town that was predominantly black. About 65% of the residents, 67% of the residents of Ferguson, Missouri at the time uh, were, were black. There were only three black police officers out of about 54 police on the force. Um, the mayor was white, the police commissioner was white. Um, and the person who shot him, again, he wasn't prosecuted, he wasn't convicted. He left on his own accord, he wasn't even fired, and just went to a new police station in Missouri. And that tends to be what happens. That's sort of, I hate to say it, like the Catholic Church and what they do with priests. But they just sort of move around, and so you're not addressing the problem. Um, so uh, in any event, here you have, um, just a couple of concepts here. I've been focusing on one here. Uh, social construction of knowledge, okay? And they basically argue, which is the case in that CRT framework, the claim that established knowledge within a discipline cannot be reevaluated using anti racism modes of analysis, which is not true. You can do that. The conventional methodological approach is the belief that empirical research is impermeable to social or political influences. We know that is not the case in PA. <laughs> and what happens eventually, and that and their review of the literature shows, that crimes then are mostly committed by black people, especially black men, which is which is also not true. Um, you know, if you if you engage in racial profiling and you're you're constantly stopping blacks and you're not stopping whites, but you're stopping blacks, let's say five out of ten have, might have a concealed weapon, then we can we can conclude that it, that black people are the ones that carry weapons. And <laughs> I'm saying that sarcastically because you can't if you're only profiling blacks. But that's what you end up with. Crimes are mostly committed by black people, especially black men. Uh, a CRT methodological approach they're suggesting, for example, a systematic review or a meta-analysis of studies that criminalize blacks and black men, positing that race is a biological term, uh, determinant to show that the spurious nature of research claiming that race is biological and that violence is innate. 
which it is not. Um, so I'm suggesting, again, that we apply CRT to public administrative studies. First, from a qualitative standpoint, we have an enormous amount of research that applies feminist theory to PA, critical theory and feminist theory. Camp Stivers, Janet Hutchinson, Pat Shields, they have done an enormous amount of work applying feminist theory. We could look to these studies to guide us in terms of applying the uh, critical race theory. The assumptions might sound similar. Gender is a social construct. Data society are not neutral. Researchers cannot be completely objective. And the administrative state is not neutral. It's genderized, it's racialized. We have a we have racialized administrative state, a genderized administrative state. Um, I have a couple of really, I think, incisive quotes from Stivers, who has really, again, written extensively um, on public administration and the application of feminist theory. Is it's a critical, uh, it's critical of existing reality. Feminists view women's historical exclusion from certain human pursuits, such as politics, and confinement to others, such as homemaking, as if not always deliberate on the part of individual men, certainly not natural. Feminists argue that such arrangements make women more likely than men to encounter neglected perspectives and ask submerged questions about the terms and characteristics of our common existence. This is an, another interesting quote from Kim uh, Stivers, Gender Images in PA, which draws on the work of some of the founders of the field. And she says, the state has never been neutral on the subject of women. And again, it hasn't been on race either. You can substitute race for women here when you apply CRT. In fact, at the time when Wilson and Goodnow were urging administrative ne neutrality, women still could not vote. If Wilson, who was teaching at Bryn Mawr College when he penned his famous essay in 1887, had listened to his students, all women, that were all women at the time, at Bryn Mawr, on the issue of suffrage, instead of disdaining and patronizing them, he might have been more cautious about concluding that the weightier debates of constitutional principle were no longer of more immediate practical moment than questions of administration, the, you know, politics administration, that we can have neutral administrators or neutral administrator, administration. We, we do not have that. We can't achieve that. This is, um, this could be an example. They, they don't explicitly use the term critical race theory, but they apply a critical lens to examine historical understanding of the administrative state and how it's neglected to look at racial bias, um, especially in the development of the administrative state. Um, and they write that administration is not, in fact, a matter of disconnected neutrality but is shaped and guided by historical narratives, among other factors in its environment. Narratives impart meaning, but they also limit positive change and promote institutional monoculturalism afflicted with unexamined prejudice. And they point to ignored factors, such as the impact of racial biases that have been written into US law and public policy, stop and frisk, or profiling, as I showed in the example, the qualitative example of race in um, Romero's study. President Wilson embraced the KKK, which is, which is, continues to be a domestic terrorist organization, white supremacist organization. Uh, overtly racist laws. We saw a number of laws. These laws obviously have been um, amended, um, but initially these laws defined citizens as free white persons. We had even the Asian Immigration Act of 1875 excluding Asians from immigrating to the US. So we have that history, and they are writing about this. And again, they, they're looking at racial biases, but they're, they're using a critical lens. They do not specifically say critical race theory, but it is an example. You can take it as an example of what has been done uh, in a qualitative sense on race in the field. Recommendations for qualitative critical race studies. Um, Dominic Bearfield, he's a, a good friend and colleague of mine, who wrote recently that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and its impact on the relationship between black families and law enforcement. And he spoke about the talk, which I didn't know about until I read this, but 
the conversation that black families have with their teenage children, most often their sons, on how to deal with police officers. Like families of all races, black children are taught to address the police with respect. However, what makes the talk different is the belief that the lessons learned during this conversation can mean the difference between life and death. Like many black males, I can remember the moment I had to talk with my father, they, the, way, uh, the way he taught me to talk, move, and behave when stopped by a police officer. He goes on to say, unlike most of my friends, I had to talk with my dad, the police officer. We rarely hear from black police officers when we discuss police reform. And again, this is an example of what can be looked at in public administration. Police officers are in the domain of public administration. They're public servants, uh, and they wield a lot of power. We talk a lot about police reform in the US. Um, why aren't we talking to black police officers? Why aren't we going to the, their bl black police unions? Um, not just you know the official white labor unions, but you have you still have black law enforcement unions to fully represent black police officers because they're not getting fully represented by the regular white controlled labor unions. Why aren't we talking to them? And like the, this is what you can glean from this. Uh, like my father, they have an intimate knowledge of both the danger of the, of the job and the fear that many of their white colleagues have of young black teens. If we're going to t get serious about reforming our institutions, we must find a way to enter, center the voice of black police officers. Any hope of transformation will hinge on our ability to hear and act on their unique perspective. So again, narratives or stories drawing explicitly on such experiences illuminate not only how blacks are taught to behave in the presence of police officers, but it exemplifies the privileges that whites enjoy in our society. I never got to talk. And I, I like to drive, I drive very fast. I, I like, I'm on the autostrada. I really drive fast. I don't have my hands 10 to 12, 9, 3, whatever you're taught to use. And when the, when the police officer stops me, I roll the window down and I just, I hand him or her my license and registration, you know, and I like, go ahead, give me the ticket and move on with it, okay? I know I was speeding, just do it. I have privilege to do that because I'm a white person. They're not going to take me out of my car and frisk me and handcuff me because I'm white and I know I have that privilege, but I was never taught, taught about the talk. But um, it's important, again, what, what Bearfield says is talk to black police officers to help a study and bring about police reform. Obviously, accountability and transparency are, are important. We need that in our police, um, police organizations and law enforcement offices. But what, what underlies the violent behaviors of police toward black and brown persons? What, what is it? Are they, are they motivated by racial prejudice? And here are some potential questions that I thought of. And again, these are the things, why do we continually have, why was Eric Garner killed in 2014 and choked to death? And why was George Floyd, uh, six years later, choked to death? W you know, what, what is it about white police officers? Are they fearful of potential force or resistance from blacks? Eric Garner, all, he, he dared to say, you know, I'm out here on the street. I'm trying to make some money. I'm selling a loose, um, some Lucy's. Let me give you one other, mother, one other example of white privilege. I was walking home. Um, this was this was before COVID. Um, so this got to be three years ago. But I was walking home. I was um, on the street, walking, and I saw undercover police officers grab this very slight man. He was he was white, but they were they were knocking up, up against the concrete wall. His face was getting all scratched, and they threw him on the ground. And one of the police officers, so this is three years ago, this is before George Floyd, but after Eric Garner, had his knee in the neck of this young, young, he was, like I said, he was very scrawny, but he apparently was resisting, had his knee in, in this young man's neck. And of course, I ran over there, not even thinking. I, I was screaming at him, I said, you're killing him, he can't breathe, can't you? He was choking, He's, and he was saying, I can't breathe. I said, you're, you're choking him, he can't breathe. And I'm screaming, and they didn't pay attention to me. But I kept screaming it, and some, somebody was filming it. Um, and so 
next thing you know, all, all these police officers descended upon the situation. And one came over to me and said, hey, lady, you better move it along. And I said, I have a right to be here. This, I have a constitutional right to be on this sidewalk. And by the way, this is my apartment building, so I have a right to be here. You can't tell me to move it along. And he walked away. And I, and I, and I immediately thought, if I was a black woman, they would have had me handcuffed and thrown in the paddy wagon. But again, it's my privilege as a white woman that I was able to scream at a cop and somebody didn't come over and grab me. They just told me to keep walking. Um, and that's, that's white privilege. But what is it, why is it that white police are fearful of force from blacks or brown people? Again, these are some of the things that we need to study. Do they resent being questioned by blacks like Eric Garner? Police often become violent when blacks gauge in constitutionally protected free speech. It is a constitutional right. It's this freedom of speech. I can do it, but apparently they don't like it when blacks do it. This is this to me gets the crux of it. The white police fear black men for other reasons. Some research suggests that white supremacy intersects with black masculinity, slavery, and racism. And again, these are all things that I think we need to be looking at in public administration when we're looking at government service, and again, police officers are um, public servants. They are in the domain of public administration, and this, this is something that needs attention. Um, Shannon Portillo, also a friend and colleague, she wrote, again, still on the qualitative um, side of CRT, although the field works to meaningfully incorporate black, indigenous, and other people of color, BIPOC, perspectives into the top scholarship or practice in public management, we must recognize the overt and covert ways the voices of BIPOC scholars are marginalized and the implication the myth of neutrality has had and still has on practice in communities across our globe. Studying inequality or racialized differences in outcomes without understanding the policies and practices that create the context for inequality to thrive is no longer enough. We have plenty of empirical evidence <laughs> of inequalities, but we lack the th rich theoretical discussions around how racism has and continues to perpetuate inequalities. Portillo uh, urges the field to think more critically about these issues, which certainly in my perspective includes the application of CRT through narratives, counter stories, and counter narratives. So what are some examples? Well, investigating employment discrimination and microaggression. Victor Ray is a, is a sociologist, and he's written a, a lot about um, critical race theory. Um, he's not studied it, but he's, he's theorized about um, um, race in, in, in our society. But one example, ex exploring the narratives of case law, looking at litigants' insights actual experiences of black and brown people who have been discriminated against. You know, interviewing them, the people, the actual people behind the lawsuits that have been discriminated against, to get a richer context of their experiences of discrimination, learning from them what policies and behaviors led to the discriminatory practices. They have to have an idea. Did the organizational culture enable or facilitate the discriminatory treatment? You know, there are a number of questions you could ask here, but again, with qualitative research, you can, you can get at those nuances and the actual experiences of, um, of black and brown people. Was there evidence of systemic or structural forms of racism, like public policies, institutional practices, cultural representation, other norms that perpetuate racial group? inequity. Again, this is an example of what we can do in public administration to apply critical race theory from a qualitative standpoint. Uh, okay, applying quantitative tools. Like I said, in our field, at least in the U.S., and I don't know if that's the case globally, but there's really, the, the, the norm is quantitative research. It doesn't count unless it counts, if you get, the, get my, my drift. Um, and, and it's easy to do quantitative research because you can get a database and you can 
you know, you can manipulate it and data mine it for how long as you want. You can throw, keep throwing little pebbles into the stream and getting another research article and publication, and that adds to, I, I, was, I think I was talking to, um, to was it, maybe it was David this morning, about how, you, how faculty members can game the system. All of a sudden, you've got, you know, 20 publications uh, with one database that you've mined. Um, but that, that's the norm. So, uh, so uh, I still think there's a way to apply a quantitative um, focus or quantitative tools uh, if, if researchers want to move in that direction and stay in that direction. So the caveats, again, you have to recall from earlier, earlier research cannot be value-free, neutral, or purely objective. Race is a social construct, and concomitantly that measuring race or racism directly is nearly impossible. Recognize the existence of white normativity, whereby whiteness is viewed as natural and right. As critical race theorists maintain, whiteness informs research as well as practice. So here's an example of a quantitative study, um, the implying CRT. This is uh, environmental justice, which also falls in the domain of public administration. At least it does in the US. Maybe, maybe that is um, somewhat parochial, but we do study environmental issues. Um, and in this instance, the, the, the scholars were looking at it in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they were asking whether urban trees affect the quality of life for people of color. And they used a mixed methods framework here. They used qualitative data, collecting uh, interviews, U.S. Census data, but the, the main um, data point was urban forest canopy cover data. And this is like the layer of trees and branches and stems and you know what basically protects people from the from heat in the inner city, especially during the summer, but also creates um, a, a barrier to air pollution, helps to reduce air pollution. Um, and this creates for more sustainable and livable, livable communities. And it, it is in the case, I live in New York City, as I said, and, and I know this is um, ad hoc. Um, but I, I do see, I see the parks that are frequented by whites tend to be, um, you know, flowers and they have a lot of trees and they have, they have really beautiful greenery and, and the, the parks that are in the more inner city areas in New York, um, and a lot of them are basketball courts. Um, no, no, not pretty, no, um, no, no flowers, not enough trees to protect people from playing basketball in the summer heat. I mean, the, you know, again, I know this is ad hoc, but, but this is what they were looking at, and they did find in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, through a mixed methods approach, uh, an, an inequitable distribution of urban canopy cover within Milwaukee, which disadvantages black and Latinx communities. Um, and again, I think it's pretty standard um, throughout, throughout the U.S. if I had to say um, a priori. Um, so this, uh, this table basically, there's a, it's a review of studies that rely <coughs> on quantitative measures of structural racism. And so there are a host of these. I'm not, not going to go over all of them, obviously. But... Um, one of the uh, one of the measures it's called the index of race related stress. It's very commonly used, and I have I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But this is basically um, it, it gauges um, the extent to which blacks incur racism on a daily basis: microaggressions, discriminatory treatment, discriminatory slurs, any kind of inequity. And these are some, this is an index that, that is used. Here's a more formally stated what the race-related index does. And I'll give you some examples in a minute of, of what, what, uh, what language is used. Redlining is another quantitative measure that's used. Redlining 
technically is illegal in the U.S. And redlining was when banks literally took a red pen and circled black neighborhoods or brown neighborhoods so they knew where not to offer loans to. So they would deny mortgage loans. They still do it. It's not with a red line, but it's done uh, through sophisticated computer programs that essentially lead to a disparity in the odds of getting uh, a mortgage. Um, so that is still a per, uh, an index that, that is relied on. And then the, um, the index of race-related stress. These are some of the items that, that are included in this index. I just have a couple for your, um, for your consideration. It's a five-point rating scale range, ranging from zero to four. Higher scores indicates more stress related to racism. You could you know, see any one of these. Um, you've observed that white kids who commit violent cr crimes are portrayed as boys being boys, with black kids who commit similar crimes as wild, uh, uh, wild animals. You have observed the police treat whites with more respect and dignity, dignity than they do blacks. You've noticed that public services are inadequate or non-existent in black communities, police, sanitation, street repairs. Um, so this is, uh, again, the formal uh, index that, that um, gauges the level of stress in, encountered by um, blacks on a daily basis. Um, this is a, a study, a quantitative study. This is done in, in public health. Again, this is something that can, we, we study public health in, in some of our public administration programs. We have a public health program. And so again, looking at public health and looking at examples in public health, criminology, any of these other um, areas of study that rely on critical race theory can offer us some guidance in applying CRT um, to uh, public administrative studies. Chambers and colleagues, they examine the association between structural racism and disparities in birth outcomes among black and white women. And what they point out that racial segregation is one of the key indicators of structural racism. And they offer, and I'll show you what these are in a minute, redlining indices, dissimilarity index, uh, distribution of social groups across neighborhoods, isolation index, delta index. These are some of the indicators of structural racism that they relied on, and they they argue that these are key measures of structural racism. And they find that um, these indicators help explain racial disparities in birth outcomes, that black women are two to three times more likely to have an infant born at low birth weight or pre premature compared to white women. So this, this gives you um, some of the measures that they looked at. Redlining indices, I mentioned that. Black-white difference in uh, log odds of loan denial, controlling for loan amount, income. And they look at gender of the applicant as well. Uh, index of dissimilarity, this is the proportion of blacks that would have to change their place of residence <laughs> to achieve an even distribution of whites and blacks in the region. Isolation index is, represents the probability that blacks will reside in the same sub-area within a county as other blacks. And then um, the delta represents the portion, uh, proportion of blacks that would have to change their place of residence to achieve uniform density across the country. So that's the study by Chambers and colleagues. So just some conclusions here. Um, the voices of blacks, Latinx, and other persons of color have been absent in the history of PA and studies of bureaucracy. There's a long gestation for the legitimacy of investigating racism in public administration. Um, but we, we don't like to do that. Good has written a really good book calling Race the Nervous Area of Government that we in the U.S. do not like to talk about race. People don't like to, to confront it. They don't want to deal with it. And so we get nervous about it, is what she says. And that is the case. And so we sweep it under the carpet. Um, examine theories as well as practices that are significant to matters of race, as well as ethnicity, gender, and gender identity. It requires public administration scholars to go beyond traditional topics, which is I'm trying to say in the beginning, you know, like pushing ourselves a little further and looking at areas including areas that are contemporary and relative to the field, and keeping up with other fields in the social sciences. 
um, CRT provides a lens and understanding of how white supremacy, institutional racism, and the subordination of people has been created and maintained in America. Working to ameliorate racism and change the bond that exists between law, public policy, racist practices, and racial profiling and racial power. And this is pertinent for qualitative or quantitative studies. Again, if you prefer doing, you know, using quantitative tools, you can still apply a CRT framework. But it does require the field in part to return to its normative root, the compassionate side, this art, the art, the art side of PA, and ask. Why does the import, abhorrent problem of police violence against black and brown persons continue in our society? And why do the crimes go unpunished? What can practitioners of public administration, that's our MPA students, what, what can they do to help diminish and end the problem or help dismantle it? Um, I, actually, I'm beginning with uh, to look at with um, Shannon Portillo and my colleague uh, Dominic Fairfield looking at examples of where states across the country have been attempting to dismantle uh, structural or institutional racism. Not, not a lot going on, let, let's say that, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of um, policy um, in the offing, policies are not being implemented. And if they are being implemented, they're not being um, followed up. We don't. There's no accountability to determine if they're effective or not. But um, so these are some police reforming, involving, as I mentioned, police Latinx fraternal police organizations, ending uh, the practice or policy of disproportionate incarceration of men and men of color, um, decriminalizing the use of drugs, and we've begun to do that. Healthcare keeping hospital trauma centers open to, to ease travel time for emergency care in areas where we have large black populations. Education, ending um, segregation in schools. Re I don't have reparations on here, I don't think, but reparations are another, um, are another uh, way to dismantle um, this, the practice of racism structurally and institutionally. There's only one city in the US it's Evanstown, it's right outside of Chicago, that ha has begun to offer reparations, 15,000 in the form of housing vouchers for blacks. And this is reparations for slavery in our society. Um, but there, there are other ways too, and again, these are things that we've been investigating. Um, for example, in New York City, um, our previous mayor, uh, de Blasio, uh, settled a lawsuit. It was a lawsuit um, by black and brown police officers who were illegally kept out of the police force. They were given used. They were um, used exams that were culturally culturally biased. They were not job related. That's what the leap of the law looks at. Whether you're job related, there's a, a host of problems with that as well. Um, and um, and uh, so this, the, the, the courts were basically finding that there was discrimination. And what Mayor de Blasio did was, instead of pursuing and challenging the court case, he basically settled it and offered millions of dollars in back pay and health care that these, police off these persons would have had had they been hired than they should have been hired legally. So again, to me, that is another, another form of reparations. It targets a group, but it's still a form of reparation for the discrimination that was incurred by these black police officers and brown, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, black and brown citizens that wanted to be police officers. Employment, well, the biggest thing to me is dumping merit exams. We still rely on them and they still disproportionately harm, and, and women as well. You know, we have, for example, in firefighting, we have maybe 3% of our firefighting forces throughout our country are um, comprised of women. Women are still kept out, and the belief is, is that they shouldn't do it, then they don't have the, the physical strengths to do it, um, but um, 
again, the, the exams, the exams are, um, are, um, have an adverse impact on them as well. And, and when they do go to court, those exams are not job related. In any case, that, that's another. So dumping merit exams, land practices, uh, this is another way in which um, institutional uh, and institutional racism can be dismantled. Acknowledge and recognize, for example, the Native American tribes as traditional stewards of the land on which an entity is located. And we do that these days. Uh, building social movements, protests, movements, they need funding. Finding funders to support them, building movements, not organizations like Black Lives Matter is certainly one example here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chi. It was very, uh, very interesting, uh, fascinating, and uh, challenging uh, at the same time. Pushing, pushing. Very pushing, uh, but uh, important as well. Do you have time for yes, some questions? Yes. Then I, I would I hope uh, to be able to answer. That David, okay. maybe you could uh, animate <laughs> a little bit the, the discussion. Okay, fine. <laughs> of course, I, I took some notes. Okay. Thank you very much Thank uh, you. for your presentation. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I have just a, a very practical question regarding uh, the, the knowledge developed by applying CRT uh, to public administration. Are, is this knowledge shared with public agents so as to make, a, for instance, a difference <laughs> uh, in their behaviors or in public policies they, they, uh, they are in charge of? Well, it depends on where, where you're at. If you're in Texas, no. <laughs> if you're in Florida, no. I mean, that's why I said it's, it's been very much politicized, and so... In places like New York and the in the in the blue states, the more progressive states, yes, and it it, it is shared. Um, but the the like I said, the, the MAGA right, they they've been using it as a political weapon. They don't want it in the classrooms they, because they don't understand it. They 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 don't want their young children to understand what racism is and that their forebearers may have been responsible for slavery. They don't want their children to know that. Why? Why don't they want them to know that? That I mean, it's yeah. So it's uh, you know again, it's become very political, um, and um, so if you're talking about sharing this kind of uh, knowledge to um, you know predominantly Republican states, there, there's a there's a backlash against it in general where. Uh, Republicans have tried to keep it out of the classroom, like the K, um, um, K, um, kindergarten, K one through um, high school. In fact, so even in the early elementary grades, they don't want critical race theory taught. But the, again, it's that sense of you know racism, race. They don't want the term to be even discussed. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, so, um, so it just, it depends, like I said, there, it's not uniform in the U.S., and it has to, it's, it's politically based. I mean, when you think about it, Trump, Trump ran on a, uh, platform of class and race-based nationalism, so that tells you something. And he had a lot of followers, I mean, enough followers to contest the, the election in 2020, and they're still peddling this stuff. Um, and, you know, what, what, is, what is, you know, class and race-based nationalism? I mean, that's white supremacy is what that is. And that's what some of these protests are still all about. It's, it's white supremacist protests across our country. Any other question from uh, this? Thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. I'm a social policy researcher and I was uh, wondering, I mean, the examples that you gave were mostly from the criminal justice system or from uh, police enforcement. Right. And is there research uh, applying critical race theory to other uh, public services, social services, and, and thinking precisely social services, uh, Child protection, uh, employment services, housing, yes, these kinds of things. Because I can imagine, I mean, 
uh, maybe the outcomes are less dramatic right. or visible, but the mechanisms uh, are likely to be to, to be there uh, similar. Yes. And um, yeah, maybe I mean you were now in your answer you were talking about the, the, the huge difficulty or near impossibility to get your message across uh, to, 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 to to the other side. Right. Maybe also because uh, it's, it's about issues of life and death, so it's really highly dramatic when it is about police interventions. If it were, I don't know, some more uh, mundane public <laughs> administration <laughs> decisions, maybe it would right. be possible to depoliticize a little bit this kind of thing. Um, two, two questions, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. well, it, there, there, are, there are other studies, um, and I, I, I think I, I cite them in, in this little, this is this is just a small little um, Cambridge University Press. I, as I was beginning to write on this topic, I, um, I put together one of these little um, elements, and um, yes, it's being used in um, in areas like child psychology. It's been it's you being used in um, education, um, so it's it, it is being used in um, in different areas and practical areas that. That you could draw from. Um, if you understood U.S. Policy, <laughs> politics, everything is politicized. I mean, ev even if it doesn't need to be, but because if the left, if the more progressive side says, you know, it's got to be X, the the right is going to say no, it's Y. It doesn't it doesn't matter. They'll try to politicize. Um, politicize it, you know, even even things around health care, for example, which it, it, it's so easy to say, yes, we need some kind of universal health coverage in, in, in our country. And even if you could, you know, say, yes, that, that is the case, it's still going to be argued and, and you are still going to have resistance from the right, from the Republican Party, especially and, and I and I can't state the the, the um, you know I can't overstate how aggressive the Republicans have become under Trump. I mean, able to do things and say things that they would have never done before, and they are so worried they they tiptoe around because they're afraid that Trump is going to hurt their reelection campaigns, and so and so everything is just become so hypersensitive. And so maybe prior to 2016, it, it would have been the case, but it's, it's not. It's, you know, Obama tried to w work with a bipartisanship. No, it can't be done. Um, uh, Biden, who uh, who's, was a senator for many years and worked across the lines, and he said he was going to do it. No, he can't do it. And so it's very, very difficult, even in topics that you think would be you know, education, for example, um, or um, or child care. You know, we, I, I don't want to really politicize this, but, you know, the recent decision by the Supreme Court, which makes abortion illegal. Um, okay, you have to, yeah, so you have to have your children. We don't want to pay child care. We don't want to give you any time off for, fa for family care. U the U.S. is an industrial nation. We still do not have a family leave policy. You can take time off for work, but it's unpaid. And even if you do, if you look at the research that's being done, women get penalized when they go back. They're demoted. They're put in uh, closets instead of the offices they had before. They're, they're punished. So, um, so uh, you know, it, that's counterintuitive to me. And then what if I told you that most of the abortions that we see in the U.S. are women between 21 and 32, and they're white? What would that tell you? Again, you know, it's, 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 it, it, they're, not, they're talking about replacement uh, theory now. That, that's what the MAGA right is talking about. They, are, they see that the black population, the brown population is increasing in our society, and they think they're going to replace the whites. And we are going to see a majority by 2050. 
is the, um, are the estimations that black and brown people will comprise the majority and they are fighting it as best as they can. And so um, this replacement theory is, has, be, has become very, um, very much in vogue. Um, yeah, I, 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 there are so many other examples I could raise, but um, yeah. Is that Yes, this is just a point where I have my critical remark on what you brought up in your very interesting presentation. Namely, why do you call this phenomenon you describe a theory? For me, that is not a theory. That is just an observation. The theory would then be, why? How can we explain this observation? Of course, you say, the physical reality shows that there is discrimination, and then you say that is because of racism. Then this becomes a theory. But for me, the more interesting issue would be why racism exists. And there comes the second point. But for me, why do you call racism a structural value? For me, that is not structural. The structuralism has the disadvantage, and this, it is a very frequent mistake for me uh, in science to call things we cannot explain structural. It is not structural. It is an expression of an actor's behavior. You can observe. So you can, you have not to to uh, remove towards structuralism as a term, as a theoretical concept, with the French uh, basics or also the constructivism, something very sim simple. But you can demonstrate that structures are constructed by actors with a certain interest, with a certain intention to exclude other actors, etc. So you can bring that back on the level of actor scales. And my third observation, and this is an observation again, for me, it is just normal that a racist administration produces racist politics. So it is not a, a scientific question. People believe if you look at Trump's, Trumpists, which are majoritarian, these are political choices and not structures. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry to, to take a little bit the counter uh, point of view, which might be a, a more European point of view. Uh, I believe that you can really decline many of the phenomena you describe down to the actor's level and describing in terms of actors, resources, rules of the games, etc., not only on the level of policy making, but on the level of policy implementation. Well, that's why I said that, you know, that institutions are made up of individuals, and so it is cumulative, it's individual acts. I agree that, um, that a lot of it is a function of how individual, individuals act, but I mean, you take, you take a concept like merit, for example. I mean, I don't know if you rely on merit in, in, your, in your public service hiring. Yes. You do, okay. Um, and does, does it have an adverse effect on any particular group in your society? It could, you know, with women, for example. No, see, yeah, this is, some of this is exclusive to the US, I know, but, um, but, but uh, let, let me give you an example of, I know it's individual acts, but, but when, it's, when it's legitimized by law and public policy, for example, because I've, I've studied this with, with women, um, you know, why do we have so few women firefighters when they want, it's a good job, it's a good paying job. Um, well, first of all, the incumbent men don't want them in there because it's a community. You live as a community in the U.S. and you live together and you work together and they don't want women. They don't think women can pull their weight. So in New York City back in the 70s, there was a, a woman, Brenda Berkman, who dared to, to challenge 
the physical exi uh, physical agility exams for firefighting, because that's what keeps them out, not the written exams. It's physical agility exams. And she said these exams are not jo job related. So the law requires that you make the, the exams job related. So it relates to the actual features of the job. So what, what they had was they had things like squeezing a dynamometer and these things that were not related to the job. So, so the city evaluated the test and it said, okay, we're going to develop a new test. And so what they did was they developed a concurrent validity, validity exam, which meant they went in and tested the job incumbents and they used them as the resource for developing the new test. It passed muster. Somebody sees where I'm going. It passed muster with the courts because it's now valid, because it's job related. But you've essentially created an exam asking if women are as strong as men. That is not a job related exam. That's structural and it's now legal. So there is an example, and I know it's individuals acting in a certain way, but that, that basically has passed legal muster. And that's what cities across the country are doing. They're using concurrent validity exams. They're testing the men. That is structural, and that's institutional. And it goes beyond just what individuals are doing. And by the way, when these women, Brenda Berkman, they were able to pass this exam, a small amount of women were able to, and they got into the fire department. The men were pissing in their boots, defecating in their beds. In one case, they were cutting their, slashing their tires. And that's individual stuff, absolutely. But this was the kind of harassment they, they, they faced. One woman had her air hose tampered with, which put her life in danger. This was behavioral. Um, but, you know, again, those are the individual acts, and that exists as well. We don't want women, and it's pretty, pretty blatant. Now, the other, the other thing is, is which 77% <laughs> of the fire departments in the U.S. are volunteer fire departments, and you get voted in. They don't have merit exams, and they don't have those kinds of problems because daughters and granddaughters of firefighters are brought in and they're part of the voluntary fire department. But women aren't competent. They're not capable of being firefighters. Well, look at the volunteer fire departments. They let the women in because they're because of the um, um, the the, uh, the relationship to a father or an uncle or a grandfather. Or so anyway, I so I would have to say that there there still are instances of of structural and institutional racism that you, you can't just look at individual behavior and you have to look at this, you have to look at like structural measures if you're using a quantitative study. Any questions? Uh, I have another question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, was, I was surprised that you didn't mention Asian people in, uh, in your examples. Uh, is this less of an issue or is this theory applicable to Asian people also? Um, it, it has not been. And part, part of it is that um, it, it, it is still the case that the groups that are marginalized and, and disenfranchised in our society tend to be black and brown, that brown. Latinx, so but it's Asian also Asian, not really brown. No, sure. no, and 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 and, not, not, and when I say brown, I mean also Indian, yeah. South Asian. It's it's you know it's people that, yeah. yes, that are different. They're the set asides, um, and and those are the the people that are considered in terms of race. Even though you might say you know Latin Latinx is the term that's used now, even though Lat, Lat, Latinos don't like the term. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, but 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 that 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 is what is looked at. Even if you want to say that that's really eth ethnicity and not race, but th but those are the the groups that are included. Yes, please. And also in the defense of uh, the previous presentation in particular, in particular, it's important to note that that critical uh, race uh, racial theory that applied to speci specifically Asian discrimination. 
But in that case, uh, for most Asian people, the forms of racism we suffer are really different. And for example, we don't suffer from uh, racial profiling when it comes to police interventions. So I think that's why she, it would justify why she would focus more up on black or brown people. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I mean, there was uh, there there w was um, in the U.S. and especially in New York City um, a, a, a rise in violence against Asian people after mm -hmm. after COVID hit. Um, and it was it was very um, very disturbing. Um, but um, so I am I'm, I'm not suggesting at all that Asians don't do not face discriminatory practices that that's not that's not my intent it's it just you asked about this theory and that's it's been applied really to to black and um, brown people yeah, just very very quickly just to highlight the fact that it is uh, something structural um, maybe you can mention the i mean the health sector is uh, really uh, a case where you have plenty of example of uh, like the St tuskegee study yes maybe you know it? yes it's a uh, it's a medical trial on black men uh, mm -hmm. suffering from uh, syphilis. Yes. And uh, it was a medical trial where actually uh, uh, some of the black men did receive the treatment and the yes. other ones uh, did the placebo, but the placebo was not even the, the normal treatment. It was uh, nothing at all, so that actually they died from uh, syphilis. Yeah. It's a study that lasted for 40 years, yes. I think. And, uh, and it's something structural because, you know, the laws do not allow for that abuse but it was made. And what also you can observe is still medical trials. The laws, uh, the US laws for, uh, to, to be able to implement medical trials uh, today in America are so, so strong that actually uh, um, the medical trials are taking place in uh, African countries. You have a beautiful uh, movie about that. It's called The Constant Gardener. Yes. Uh, where it is shown that actually American uh, uh, medi me me medical uh, staff were that were not able to, to, to yes to do this uh, uh, in the US came to I think it was in North Nigeria uh, to a small village it was against a, a medical trial against blindness I think yeah. and actually again it's uh, something that there, there were a lot to do because the laws in this country were uh, much uh, weaker yeah. and and there are, there are no no scrupule, no, no, nothing yeah. to do to do that. Yes. Yeah. So here yeah, it is much more about structure. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, and that, and that that's an excellent. Those are excellent examples, and the, the movie that you mentioned is really. And and I also just want to build on that with the Tuskegee the Tuskegee experiment that um, when when COVID hit um, in the in the U.S., blacks were less likely to be results were showing that the blacks were less likely to get the vaccination and people are saying why why well there's some socio-historical reasons why they don't want to go to the government to get a you know get a jab yes. so mm -hmm. you know so you have to understand that instead of saying oh you know there was there was a backlash against blacks because they didn't want to get vaccinated but you know there was the socio-historically I wouldn't have gotten a, a, a vaccine if I if you know my my family had had been infected with syphilis. So you th those are structural issues. You're absolutely right, and that's a really good example. Thank you. Uh, I had a question uh, concerning the, the, the following follow-up of the, the war in Ukraine, because uh, now the, the European governments, the Switzerland too, they are um, deciding to, to give the a special status to the Ukrainian, Ukrainians. Yes. And um, it's, of course, uh, very good huh, to give such, such decisions. But now the, there is the question for the other people that come from uh, yes. other, <coughs> other countries yes. that are suffering for, from yes. wars and that are not right. And in fact, uh, the, the question, I think, is not very publicly asked if there is a Russia, racism or not, what is your thoughts right. about it? Um, well, you know, I might be the wrong person to ask because I absolutely, yeah. I mean, to me, I, in my entire career and, um, and my life has been about promoting social justice. I mean, I, social equity is, you know, the first pillar of public administration to me. And so 
I'm a firm believer in social justice and social equity, and um, and so um, <coughs> you know, to me, those those are inequalities that. Um, but again, they those things become so politicized, um, and so you know, you can ask me personally, and I can respond. But even as a you know, as a public administration, as I still believe that there has to be some some fairness and. Um, and so I, you know, again, um, I, I would say there has to be this fairness and equity there. Um, but again, it, it, it's, it becomes so politicized mm -hmm. that, um, Thank you very much for your talk, Norma. Just beforehand, you said that uh, in America, we don't like to talk about race. But at least you talk about it. Yes. <laughs> Here um, we have this perspective that um, is um, uh, put forward, always put forward. Actually, is colorblind. Uh, the colorblind. Colorblind. Oh, colorblind. I would like to hear a bit more about your thoughts about colorblind approach because it's quite a fallacy. Uh, it is a fallacy. And it's pretty much very racist. It's, it's, so yep. how do we engage? discussion well, it's and how we do, do we engage with the public not only uh, within the academia well that you know that that was the the um the neoconservatives raised the colorblind mm -hmm. issue in the US in the 70s when affirmative action first came on the scene uh, especially in 1978 with the first supreme court decision on uh, on affirmative action and the notion was, oh, you know, we don't need affirmative action because we, we are a colorblind society. We see, we don't see color, which is fallacious. I mean, we do see color, we do see gender, we do see race. That's why I said, you know, we live in a racialized and genderized administrative state. There's no such thing as colorblind. And, um, but that was the fallacy and that was, that was being peddled by the neoconservatives back in, in the 70s as, um, as oppos in opposition to the use of affirmative action, which is a legal tool. You know, affirmative action is quotas. It's not quotas. An, uh, an organization doesn't set quotas for itself. It does set goals and timetables, and if you don't meet them, you don't punish yourself. There's no sanction. Courts can set quotas. That's not, a, that's not affirmative action. And so, again, politicized, everything got politicized, and the right said, you know, we're, we're a colorblind society. We don't want to look at race. We don't want to look at gender, which is totally uh, fallacious. And so, um, so I think, I don't think that's the, the right approach. Now, I know in Europe they do have gender quotas. And I, and I think that's important. I, you know, but, but those are quotas that are being set by government, correct? So, you know. But organizations themselves cannot set a quota for themselves. We live in a society now at least where diversity is valued. And in America, it was first the private sector that said we need to embrace it. And they did because it was a bottom line issue. We serve diverse communities. And so we have to have diverse workforces to reflect the communities we serve. And the public sector, then they, oh, yeah, that's right. We, have, we do the same. We provide public services. We need to be diverse and reflect. That's the representative bureaucracy theory. But um, you know, it, it started for us in America with the private sector recognizing. But it was a bottom line business issue. It was about the money. Um, but in the U.S., it, 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 you know, it is about representing the needs and interests of people who fall through the cracks. And again, in our society, it's black and brown people that are consistently, systematically um, de disenfranchised. I mean, I can't even explain the, the number of states, the red states, that are changing their laws, their voting laws, their redistricting. Um, and going in black neighborhoods to dilute the black vote so Republicans will hurt the black vote in a community where there might be a Democrat running against a Republican. I mean, it is atrocious. And the courts are upholding these, um, these laws. Um, but th that's, that's, that, that's people doing that. You're absolutely right. But the, syst the, the, the systemic impact is where 
um, you know, you're you're delegitimizing, you're disenfranchising the, the ability to have they have the right to vote, but it doesn't count. It's not going to count because you've gone in and you've basically um, cut up the district, so you've um, you've basically weakened the black vote in a particular area or the Latina uh, Latinx vote. Last week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask a question related to the very beginning of the presentation. At the very beginning, you mentioned uh, our bureaucracy uh, should be representative because our representative governments are not representative. And at that stage, I would have expected that you mentioned the word or the expression affirmative action. So my question is very simple and perhaps also naive. Uh, what is the relationship between affirmative action and critical racial view? Well, that, that's interesting because a lot of the criminal, um, the uh, critical race theorists initially, like Derek Bell, they basically said, um, you know, affirmative action was not, was not enough. Um, and they said, you know, this is, this, we don't want to think about affirmative action. That doesn't do enough. But later, like 20 years later, he came back and said, well, I may have benefited from affirmative action because affirmative action is a legal tool which people misunderstand. Um, it's, it's not diversity. Some conflate diversity with affirmative action. Diversity are you know, organic um, organizational rules and policies to promote diversity. Affirmative action is basically um, something that's set by the courts, like I said. An organization cannot set quotas for itself. It sets goals and timetables. It can, it can endeavor to create a diverse workforce. But if they don't reach it, the organization doesn't punish itself. You know, it's only if, um, it's only if, for example, the these as I mentioned, the the, the black and brown citizens in New York City <coughs> that wanted to be police officers, they took a test. They didn't pass the test, and then they filed the lawsuit. Affirmative action would mean the courts basically coming in and saying the exam discriminated against this cohort, and so you now need to ensure that, that the next group of people you hire, this is how it works, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily affect the people that took it 10 years ago, and that's what was good about de Blasio. He actually provided reparations to these people that should have been police officers. The, what the affirmative action does is says to the, to the city of New York, okay, the next time you have a hiring of police officers, 5% need to be blacks, let's say. And so the city basically says, okay, that's, that's affirmative action, and that is where the city will face a sanction if it doesn't meet it. You know how often sanctions are implied by the courts when the, when the cities don't meet their, their uh, affirmative action targets? Zero, exactly. You showed a good faith effort? Okay, there, you're done. We know we, we, there's, there's no, nothing else we can do. So even when you have affirmative action, which is a legal tool, it is not enforced. It, the courts are not basic. It's, it, there's no accountability. So. That's a good question, and it's um, but affirmative action is sometimes conflated, but it um, so it's not something that the critical race theorists will will really will really look at. Good. Let me quickly uh, ask a question on yeah. that. I, I think you said something on the on the race as being non biological or something like that. Right. Um, then it's probably something I struggle to understand, um, given the white black dichotomy. Right. that you are using, right? If it's not yes. biological, then uh, where does the difference come from? And it comes from, and, and that's one point. The second point which relates a bit to that is the idea that I wonder if, um, I mean, I would have loved to, to probably see much more data on, on all the, the issues you presented, and I wonder if there is not something more like dominant, dominated dichotomy, right? Because I tend to, to think that in the, in, in, the, in the people who are trying to oppress, there might also be uh, people that, are, that we are currently seeing as being oppressed, mm -hmm. right? 
uh, and the and the other way. Uh, right. So it goes both both ways, right. and right. I, and I want to see. I mean, I want to hear what okay. what are your thoughts on that because that's probably the way. Okay. Um, I mean, I would think all okay. because of this. Yep. Well, when we say race is a social construct, you know, y you're you're right. There, you know, you you, you do check off a box if when you apply for something if you're black or white or, but when we say socially constructed, it means that society determines what you're going to get as a black person and what you're not going to get. It's the rules that apply, the laws that apply, it's constructed by society, and society makes those decisions solely based on your race, your color. Um, that's not biological, right? It's what society sees. It sees, you know, it's not colorblind. It sees a color, and it automatically, for banks, they'll put a red line around it. You're not going to get a loan because you're black. That's, that's a social construction of race. That's what we mean by that. And you're right that there are, in some cases, if you look at police departments, for example, and I, I've done some work in this area too, and it's around representative bureaucracy, and it's around symbolic representation. Does it make a difference, for example, if you have um, blacks on the police force symbolically? Does it make a difference to you that you see yourself reflected in that workforce. And the research shows that it does. Even though, in some cases, black police officers may be just as harsh on black citizens as a white police officer. And part of that has to do with how you're socialized in police departments. You, blacks realize they have to be part of the group. They have to be part of the clan and part of the you know, socialized structure. So that means they have to show that they go along with the white officers and how white officers are treating black people or brown people. So that is actually uh, a concern. But again, some of the some of the research shows that, um, and there's I've, d I've done research with uh, around this issue with women too, um, and it's it's you know symbolic that if you have in um, Domestic violence, for example, does it matter if you have women police officers? And the research shows, and I've done some of this research, that yes, it does matter because a woman is m more likely to report the crime officially to a woman than to a male police officer. They'll report it to a female police officer because they feel more comfortable. And that's the only way you're going to get um, domestic violence addressed. If police reports are not filed, because in a lot of cases in domestic violence, the victim will say, and it's mainly a woman that's the victim, the woman say, I don't want to file an official, of an official report. And if they don't file the report, you can't do anything. But if a woman police officer is talking to the victim and the victim is willing to um, report it, once it's reported, then it becomes official and the government can do something about it, if you will. They can have a, you know, a, um, a warrant against the abuser, the partner, the husband, the whatever. Um, so, um, so it makes a difference to have diversity in police forces. I know I keep coming back to, to police. It's, it's one area that I study a lot. <laughs> so, um, and because, because I, I see it, I, I see it in the city you know, I lived in Albany. I was at SUNY Albany for 17 years before I went to Rutgers, and when I moved to the city, it, it's, it just is so blatant to me, um, the, the arrogance of the police in New York City. It, it's, it's so dramatic. Um, uh, and, um, and so, again, just, just seeing it has, um, you know, uh, and again, <laughs> It's very difficult to be objective. It's very difficult to be objective when you see this. Um, and um, but I, I, you know, and again, I know there is no such thing as pure objectivity for researchers. You choose a topic. You choose a research method. You choose. You make choices. There's a lot of subjectivity in this. And um, so, you know, from a, an epistemological standpoint, you're you're not going to have pure objectivity. I just don't believe believe that. Very, very last question. Raise your hand. I don't know.
a question about uh, the merit and meritocracy. You mentioned an example of uh, physical disparities in testing, for example, fire firefighters, but your example in the presentation was more about the cultural um, aspects. So I was just a bit surprised because I grew up in Florida in this uh, school, so I had all the, in deep red Florida, I had all the standardized tests and so on. And I actually went to school in majority minority uh, uh, schools, so you know, Title I schools where most of the students were black, brown, Latino, or otherwise immigrants. And I mean, never ever was the question of, uh, never did I hear any of my colleagues say that, uh, they, that the cultural, there was any cultural bias in the questions. And even I realized that you know, my immigrant colleagues generally perform better than the Anglo-Saxon locals, which makes me wonder how is cultural bias in these standardized tests uh, measured? Because I mean, from I, I've taken 30 or 40 standardized exams and never has it, with all the immigrants and all the black and brown and Latino people around me, mm -hmm. has it been apparent? Well, it's, yeah, that's, just, it, it, you know, it, get, it gets back to the issue of when we, when we talk about cultural bias, it's um, if, if you have, um, and, and you, you know, you're, you're in Florida, and, and I, I'm sorry to say that's, that's an outlier. Um, <laughs> it, it is an outlier in terms of the resources that go into schools. They have very low property taxes, for example. That's why a lot of people from the north move down to the south, because they don't want to pay property taxes, and the school systems are, they're a little different. Let's, let's, let's leave it at that. But if you, if you go to school, um, where there are a lot of resources, and you have computers when you're in third grade, and you have you know that's, uh, access to technology and the knowledge and the books and the and you have two parents at home and you have you have you know you sit down to take a test to get into a an undergraduate program or a master's program. I don't know if you have the GREs. We have the GREs for PhD students. Now, not for them, fortunately, not for master's students. If you put those two people down and have them take the test, which one is going to do better on the test? The person that's had an opportunity, the equal opportunity to uh, uh, education, the person that's been deprived that education because you don't have the computers in school, you don't have the technology, you 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 are from a single family home where your mother is working to make you know ends meet so when you go home after school you don't have two parents at home or a parent at home that doesn't have to work because the father is earning the living or what have you um, it's, it's generally I hate to I don't mean to be heterosexist about it but that's how it works out um, because the men make more money. We know men make more money than women in the U.S. Maybe that's not the case here, but they make more money. And there's a <laughs> huge wage disparity in the U.S., public sector and private sector. So the point is, is that those two people do not have parity when they sit down to take a test that basically is going to determine what school you can go to, what job you can get. You, you don't have the tools and the skills to compete equally with somebody that has that that education, that knowledge, the, t the skills to use to, to create a spreadsheet in Excel. You know, these little simple things that you may overlook, but you sit down to take a civil service exam, that's it. You can't take it because you don't have the knowledge to, to perform well. Um, so. But in my experience, those schools with poor kids had more funding, so we had actually excess practice with standardized exams with success maker, this program, success maker, um, accelerated math. So we had, compared to the other schools which had richer kids, they maybe had better facilities for gym, but we actually had more funding for, uh, for the standardized exams compared to them. And even with computers, the most school I went to was former black school, mostly uh, black and brown. Uh, 
everybody got an uh, uh, Apple laptop, which would not happen at all in the richer schools. Well, th th you're describing a very atypical situation, I'm sorry to say. That is, that is not America, I'm sorry. That is very, a it's very atypical. In, and, in what area in Florida? It's was a it? red county, Brevard County. I'm sorry? It's a red county, Brevard County. Oh, yes, okay, I know, I know it, county. Um, it's, that's very a a atypical, though. It does not, it's not representative of the U.S., I'm sorry. If we look at the data and the statistics, it is, is simply not representative. I'm happy to hear that, and I wish that we, we had that throughout the United States, but that doesn't work that way, and, it, and it's unfortunate. And I, like I said, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear it, but it's just a very atypical. Thank you so much. Thank you.